Welcome back. In the second part of the lecture, I will talk about some of Franklin's background assumptions about the metaphysics of agency. Okay, so let's get started. So a theory of agency should explain a number of basic distinctions, a number of basic aspects of agency. It should explain what distinguishes an action, such as you raising your arm, from something that merely happens to you such as me raising your arm. It should, it should explain the distinction, distinction between voluntary actions, such as me deciding to take a sip of water, from automatic actions, such as reading a street sign, which I do without even thinking about it. And it should explain the difference between free actions, that you do freely, and unfree actions. For example, when an addict takes drugs, it's still an action, but it may not be a free action. And it should explain the distinction between basic actions and non-basic actions. And a basic action is something such that you can do it without doing anything else. For example, deciding to uh, murder the Archduke of Austria, that would be a basic action. But starting World War I would be a non-basic action because you do start World War I by doing something else. You start it by deciding to assassinate someone. And so a very promising theory of action that has a lot of support in the literature is the causal theory of action. And it's usually presented as just a theory of basic intentional actions. But it will be instructive to look at it. So the causal theory of action, or CTA, says that an agent S performs a basic action phi if and only if phi is non-deviantly caused by appropriate mental states and events involving the agent S. So let's look at these two conditions in turn and start with the second condition, that the action needs to be, needs to be caused by appropriate mental states and events. So imagine I have an argument with my wife and she's angry with me and then we go to bed while she's still angry. And also suppose that in the middle of the night, I suddenly wake up because my wife has my wife's leg has like kicked me. And I can then ask whether her kicking me was an action, perhaps she's still angry at me, or it was just a body movement that was not an action. And CTA answers this kind of question. It tells you that it was an action if it was caused by appropriate mental states of my wife. So for example, if my wife kicking me was caused by her desire to hurt me and um, her belief that kicking me with her leg would hurt me, then that counts as appropriate mental states causing the action, and so, it would call, and so the body movement would count as an action. But if her kicking me was caused by her having a dream um, about a gigantic spider chasing her and she was trying to run away from that spider, then it wouldn't count as an intentional action because that doesn't count as an appropriate mental state that makes her body movement into um, the voluntary action of hurting me. So I hope that gets you um, the idea. So whether something is an action or not depends on what kinds of mental states cause it. And in particular, whether the kinds of mental states rationalize the action. But then we still have the first condition, which is that the appropriate mental states do not just have to cause the, the action, they um, have to cause it in a non-deviant way. And that non-deviant requirement comes in to rule out counterexamples such as the following. And here's a case from Franklin. So suppose, um, suppose Sally is, a, is an assassin who decides to kill Jones and believes that if she, kill, if she pulls the trigger um, of her rifle, this will kill Jones. But then suppose that um, realizing that she has this desire and this belief and is about to kill Jones makes her so nervous, makes her freak out so much that her finger starts to tremble and then she accidentally pulls the trigger. And then we would say that even though she wanted Jones dead and was planning to kill him, 
her actual act of shooting him wasn't an action, it was just an accident. It only happened at the time it did happen because she was unnerved and her fingers started to tremble. So it shouldn't be an action, but it was caught by appropriate mental states. And so to rule out these kinds of cases, we have to appeal to the fact that the causal chain has to be a typical one or has to be non-deviant in the sense that it's a kind of a normal or usual causal chain. Causal chain. And it's just a very unusual way that you desire to kill someone and you believe that a certain, a certain strategy will um, lead to the death of that person, then causes that person's death by making you nervous and making your finger tremble. That's like an unusual or deviant causal chain. So it's not the normal kind of way how this kind of causation goes. And so that doesn't count. The causal theory of action as presented is a theory of basic actions and of voluntary actions. But at least it explains these two aspects of agency just in terms of the agent's mental states and their causal role. And so there's a position that Franklin calls agency reductionism, and agency reductionism holds that all aspects of agency are explicable in just in terms of the agent's mental states and their causal role. And this will be important because Franklin presupposes agency reductionism in his defense of free will, of libertarian free will. And it's important to notice, to um, realize that this theory is reductive, this kind of approach, because it um, explains all aspects of agency just in terms of the mental states of the agent. And it's easiest to appreciate why this makes agency reductionism a distinctive view by contrasting it with its negation, agency non-reductionism. So let's look at a version of agency non-reductionism. As an illustration of agency non-reductionism, consider a view that was defended by the philosopher Roderick Chisholm in the 60s. So Chisholm was convinced that humans had free will, and he wanted to explain how it's possible for humans to have free will. And so take the action where this person here um, decides to buy raspberry ice cream. So Chisholm thought that if determinism is true and this person's decision to buy raspberry ice cream is completely determined by his mental states, his desire for ice cream, for example, and his belief that raspberry is the best, then the action couldn't possibly be free. Because after all, you have, no, you have ultimately no control over your desires and beliefs. Of course, you may um, train yourself to have certain desires. You make yourself... Um, you may um, turn yourself into the kind of person who likes raspberry and you have some kind of control over what beliefs you acquire. But of course, um, how you exert that kind of control is again determined by what beliefs you had in the past, had, had in the past. And so you had ultimately no control over what kind of beliefs and desires you had when you started out, when you like first became conscious. And so if all of your subsequent actions were just determined by your beliefs and desires and circumstances, then Chisholm thinks that you couldn't possibly be free because all of your behavior is then caused by things out of your control. So that's why Chisholm thought that, well, if we are free, then determinism can't be true, then our behavior can't be determined by our beliefs and desires. But um, Chisholm also thought that free will, um, <clears throat> that we couldn't have free will if our choices are indeterministically, indeterministically caused by our mental states. So suppose you have again, again have the same beliefs and desires, you desire ice cream and you believe that raspberry is the best, but now indeterminism is true and given this, these beliefs and desires, there's like a 90% chance that they will cause you to buy raspberry ice cream and there's a 10% chance that they will cause you to buy vanilla ice cream. And as it happens, you buy raspberry ice cream. In this case, your choice of raspberry ice cream is not a done deal. Your beliefs and desires could also have caused you to make a different choice. But Chisholm thought that you still wouldn't be free in this scenario because your choice still wouldn't be up to you. It would merely be a matter of luck 
which decision your beliefs and desires cause you to make. And so the decision wouldn't really be free. And we come back to this problem, which is essentially the problem of luck. But now we're more interested in Chisholm's re reaction to this puzzle, in his solution. And Chisholm's solution was to posit a new kind of causation, which is now standardly called agent causation. He thinks that your choice of raspberry ice cream, if it really is a free choice, is not really caused by your prior mental states, your beliefs and desires at all. Instead, it's caused by you, the agent. He thinks that if your choice is free, then it must be fully caused by you, by the agent. And Chisholm called this kind of causation, causation by the agent. And so the idea is that every agent is a kind of prime mover. So an agent can just cause something, can just cause some action and how he and the agents causing that action is completely um, unrestrained by anything else that's going on in the world. And in particular, it's not restrained by what kinds of beliefs and desires the agent has. So just to repeat this once more, um, Chisholm thought that an action is free if it's caught by the agent rather than the agent's mental states or anything else. And Chisholm theory faces some uncomfortable question. For example, you might wonder, what role do the agent's, ment the, agent the agent's mental states play? You might think that the agent's beliefs that Raspberry is the best should play at least some role in explaining um, what ice cream the agent orders. But it's kind of unclear what role that could be if the, the action is fully caused by just the agent and not his mental states. And the second question is, you might ask, what exactly is it about the agent that made it that the agent caused the action of ordering raspberry instead of ordering vanilla. And it seems it's unclear what Chisholm can say since he can't appeal to the agent's mental states since those play no role in the causation. And he also doesn't want it to be up to chance. But let's set these issues aside. They don't concern us for now. The main point right now is just that in order to explain the phenomenon of human freedom, the phenomenon of free agency, Chisholm introduces an irreducible role for agents. He thinks that you can't explain freedom just in terms of mental states. You have to posit an agent and posit a new kind of causation that this, this agent exerts. And that makes Chisholm's account of free will a version of agency non-reductionism, because now agents play a distinctive role in it. And so we call agency non-reductionism the position that agents play an irreducible role for explaining at least some aspects of agency. So um, as soon as you think that there's at least some aspect of agency, like any one of these things here, such that to explain this aspect of agency, you have to appeal to agents directly and not just to their mental states, then you're an agency non-reductionist. And you might be a global agency non-reductionist. You might think that to explain any aspect of agency at all, you already have to appeal to agents. Or you might be um, a local agency non-reductionist. For example, someone like Chisholm could think that, yeah, to explain, what, to explain the distinction between actions and what merely happens to us, that the causal theory of action gets right. But what makes an action free, we can only explain that by appeal to agents. But as soon as you make any irreducible appeal to agents, you're going to be an agency non-reductionist. And this distinction is important because Franklin appeals to agency reductionism. His strategy is to presuppose that agency reductionism is true. And then given this assumption, he's tr he tries to show that if agency reductionism is true, then minimal event causal libertarianism is the most plausible theory of free will. Agency reductionism is a fairly widely accepted position. Okay, and so there will be a third part of the lecture in which I will briefly introduce Franklin's version of libertarianism and how, he, how it relates to other versions of libertarianism. So I'll see you back for that soon.